The best friend of Jesus. John is the name of a man who is Jesus' friend. We could even go on the assumption that he was the best friend of Jesus. Before hearing Jesus' call to follow him, John had a successful career as a fisherman. John worked in the fishery industry at both the wholesale and retail levels. We know he had contacts in Jerusalem, which most likely included a retail business selling the fish he'd caught in Galilee. As a result, he existed in two worlds, the rural north and the urban city of Jerusalem in the south. As such, he stood out from most of the apostles, who were all northerners, with Judas Iscariot being the only native southerner. He was Jesus' cousin and the brother of one of the other disciples, James. James, one of Jesus' twelve disciples, was the brother of the apostle John. John the Apostle should not be confused with John the Baptist. Together, Jesus referred to them as Bonerges, which translates to Sons of Thunder and in this moniker. John's father owned a boat, and it was while in a boat with their father that Jesus called John and James to be disciples. The two immediately left the boat and followed Jesus. Matthew 4, 18-22 Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. They were Simon, his other name was Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were putting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, I will make you fish for men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going from there, Jesus saw two other brothers. They were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were sitting in a boat with their father, mending their nets. Jesus called to them. At once they left the boat and their father and followed Jesus. This closeness was evident on the cross when Jesus asked John to look after his mother. John, however, was not just close to Jesus, but he was a cousin. He was also part of an inner circle, along with James and Peter, of those particularly close to Jesus. He refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, intending to deflect attention from himself by not giving his name, but supplying us with the insight that, of all the twelve, John was nearest to God. He had a remarkable list of service to Christ. He was one of the original twelve apostles, and Jesus included him in his inner circle during his earthly ministry. John had a close relationship with the Lord, and even witnessed his transfiguration. Luke 9, 28-29 About eight days after Jesus had said these things, he took Peter and James and John with him. They went up a mountain to pray. As Jesus prayed, he was changed in looks before them. His clothes became white and shining bright. Jesus led Peter, John and James to the mountain to pray. These three were his inner circle of disciples and they would frequently accompany him without the others. Mark 14, 33 He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He was almost certainly referred to in John's Gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he frequently appears in the Gospels alongside his brother James. John 13, 23 one follower whom Jesus loved was beside Jesus. John was the disciple who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper, as they reclined to finish their meal. This occurred during the Passover feast. Jesus wanted his close buddy to be with them as they experienced this life-changing moment together. Not only was John the disciple closest to Jesus, but he was also the last of the original apostles to live. He composed his gospel as an older man, reflecting on the life of Jesus with his particular wisdom. Jesus called James and John Bonerges, which means sons of thunder. Mark 3, 17 James and John were brothers. They were the sons of Zebedee. He named them Bonerges, which means the sons of thunder. Why they did this is not clear but it may reflect their somewhat fiery temperament or their zealous commitment to Christ. Several passages in the Gospels show Jesus and John had a very personal relationship. 
The depth of Jesus' relationship with John, however, was most evident on the cross. It was John who was singled out by Jesus. John 19, 26-27, Amplified Bible So Jesus, seeing his mother and the disciple who he loved, esteemed, standing near, said to his mother, Dear woman, look, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple John, Look, here is your mother, protect and provide for her. From that hour the disciple took her into his own home. John must have had the profound trust of Jesus. His importance in the Twelve grew as he matured, and after the crucifixion, he became a pillar in the Jerusalem church. Galatians 2.9 Amplified Bible And recognizing the grace that God had bestowed on me, James and Cephas, Peter and John, who were reputed to be pillars of the Jerusalem church, gave to me the Barnabas, the right hand of fellowship, so that we could go to the Gentiles with their blessings and they to the circumcised Jews. John then ministered with Peter. He also wrote the Gospel and three New Testament epistles that bear his name. John lived a life of service to Christ, but before he died, God gave him one more task, prophet. Toward the end of John's life, while exiled on the rocky and remote island of Patmos, he wrote the book of Revelation a prophecy detailing the final conflict between good and evil. The book of Revelation was never meant to be a university textbook. The main goal was not to reveal a timetable for future events, but to prepare people for what would happen. John, the writer, is already suffering for his faith. He is in prison, but not for a crime. He's a political prisoner on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea which is the modern equivalence of Alcatraz on Rikers Island. John had been arrested and exiled for religious purposes. The authorities see his exclusive devotion to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus as treason, a threat to the Pax Romana based on polytheistic tolerance and an imperial cult. Citizens were supposed to believe in many gods, and the emperor was one of them. Towards the end of the first century, this situation came to a head, creating a crisis of conscience for Christians. Julius Caesar was the first to proclaim himself divine. His successor, Augustus, had encouraged the construction of temples in his honor, some of which had been erected in Asia, now western Turkey. Although Nero had begun a persecution of Christians, this was limited in duration and location. He demanded universal worship of himself in the face of the pain of death. Once a year, incense had to be thrown on an altar fire before his bust with an acclamation, Caesar is Lord. The appointed day this had to be done was called the Lord's Day. That was precisely the day on which Revelation began to be written. For those who refused to say anything but Jesus is Lord, it would be a matter of life and death the word witness would take on a new, fatal meaning. The church was facing its most challenging test so far. How many people would remain loyal under such pressure? After all, John was the only one of the twelve apostles left. All the others had already suffered a martyr's death. Revelation is a manual for suffering, even unto death. It calls believers to be faithful, even to the point of death. Revelation 2.10 Revelation 1. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ.